Chicago. What do you say? It's the CHGO Cubs podcast presented by DraftKings, America's top-rated sportsbook. Make sure you download the app, and when you do it, use the promo code CHGO when you sign up. Luke Stuckmeyer, Ryan Herrera, Cody Del Mendo. It's snowing in Chicago, mm-hmm. but we're always thinking Cubs baseball on this podcast, and we got a good one for you today, especially because we have a special guest. Should we just get right to it? Let's get right to we it. Can. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, why waste any time? <laughs> we don't want to waste any of his time. <laughs> Cubs pitching coach Tommy Hadovy joins us from his home. And uh, Tommy, first of all, thanks for coming on. We really, really appreciate you joining us today. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Love talking Cubs baseball. And no better time to do it than when there's snow on the ground. It's freezing cold. And we're, you know, <laughs> months from, from pitcher catcher reporting day. <laughs> Oh man, does that sound nice? Uh, so how's how's the off season gone? I know obviously during the season, during games, you're you're at the park all day, every day. You're you're looking at the data, you're giving feedback and all that. So what? How how do you continue that pitching coach job when the off season in the off season when there's no games going on? Yeah, you know it definitely slows down. Um, you know we, the we, we joke of the you know hundred hour work weeks turn mm-hmm. into you know fifteen hour work weeks. So <laughs> it's a complete one eighty of of what the season looks like but honestly the as baseball has grown right from when i first started playing Mm -hmm. the communication level and what you had when you were a young player back in 2004 2005 communication wise with the front office with coaches has completely changed um just because there's so much information out there now there's so many initiatives and things that we want to try to accomplish and i think the, the, the switch from the off season being this recovery mode where all you do is, is recover from the season to like, we just know so much more about what the body can do and what's important. The off season, you can gain so much during these first, you know, two months of the off season. So we, we communicate, we're in communication pretty consistently with the players. Um, we usually have a weekly uh, pitching uh, infrastructure call catching up on players and issues and things that we want to accomplish. Um, it's building out player plans, building out throwing programs, building out drill packages, like all these things that we want to utilize this time for um, is this is the time to do it. So that, that's kind of the how the transition of the pitching coach job goes from in season when you're hands on every day to more of a, a planning and, and <laughs> scheduling perspective. So last year with the lockout, Despite the lockout, we saw great progress from young Cubs pitchers, especially at the major league level. Uh, do you expect that progress to be continuing now that you have a full off season? I feel like you guys were kind of handcuffed last year, not being able to do as much as you wanted to in the off season, and you still had that success. How does how does this off season look different for you? I think the the timeline we had last year, we knew that deadline was coming. So it was a rush to try to get these presentations and these packages put together that were all encompassing because we didn't know how long it was going to go. We didn't know how long you know we were going to not be able to communicate with guys. So we put together these basically these presentations, PDF PowerPoints and walk through the entire offseason with them. It was like, all right good luck, go get them. You know, like if you need anything, don't call us because we can't answer the phone. Um, and, and we were happy with the number one, the guys that we have, when they can take those initiatives on their own and go accomplish them, I think that makes our job really easy. Like coaching is great when you have great players and great players that want to actually get better and work hard. Um, and, and we were definitely proud of some of the things that we were able to accomplish with these young guys last year. The only the only thing we talked about is like it took us a little while, I think, to kind of find our footing as the season went on, mm-hmm. knowing that we didn't we, we lost two and a half months, three months of communication. So we were cramming everything into a quick spring training. Everything was about let's get these guys healthy to start the year. And then we actually used we, I felt like we used a lot of the early part of the season for a lot of these small minor tweaks mechanical adjustments pitch pitch grip pitch usage things that we wanted to hone in that we just didn't have time to work on i knew that we knew the players were working on them um mm-hmm. so once we felt like we hit that stride when, during the season then you really started seeing guys guys take off um so i i think for this off season being able to have constant communication with guys 
Um, guys are going to be able to send video. I just got video of Kyle Hendricks doing med ball work, like in Arizona, you know, like we're the, the level of communication throughout the organization with the players is going to allow us to do a lot of really fun things, even before guys start showing up in Arizona. Yeah. And that's, that's a good qu- or a good segue to my next question is you mentioned Kyle Hendricks. I guess the last update we got uh, was Jed, and, and we know that he's not – he wasn't throwing then. This is, you know, Jed's end-of-season presser. A month later, um, what is the update? Is he is he throwing, and what is his off-season kind of looking like uh, as, as you know, we start getting closer to, to spring training and, and pitchers and catchers reporting? Yeah, specifically for Kyle, um, he's not throwing yet. Uh, he's going to be on a pretty strict throwing program that's been put together by the doctors – by the uh, training staff. Um, so a lot of, he, he's feeling great. I think the shoulder has has come a long way from what he was dealing with early in the year. So uh, hasn't started throwing yet, but he's gonna be on a pretty strict regimen throwing program coming back. The one good thing though, and a lot of the stuff that we've been focused on with Kyle is just regaining some of that athleticism, mm-hmm. some of the, the, the body movement that we saw with him in 2016, 2017. Um, we saw it again quickly in like 2020 in that shortened season when he came back like feeling really good. And and we know guys as guys age, you know, velocity trends and things change, but there's mechanical things and physical things that we can emphasize to try to get guys moving better and moving more efficiently. Um, as you get older, it's even more important to move efficiently because it becomes a little bit more difficult to control all those little movements that maybe when you were 27, 28, you could get away with because you were young, you were athletic, you were had a little bit more, uh, you know, less less wear on, on the tires, I guess you could say. So being able to work on things with Kyle to really hone in on, on the, the, the physical side of it, get his body moving, get him moving a little bit faster. I think this is a great opportunity right now to work on some of those things. Tommy, uh, here on this podcast, I'm someone who I don't, I'm not an analytics guy. Like I know how <laughs> analytics are like huge in the game now, but like I'm, I'm big on the eye test and everything that, you know, I've heard or listened to or listened to interviews and stuff. And your name is brought up. Everyone is always like, he just brings the best or he helps bring the best out of a lot of guys. And we clearly have seen that with a lot of pitchers that have come through the Cubs, not just minor leaguers, but even just, uh, relievers that the Cubs picked up on the free, like through free agency over the last couple of years. David Robertson, a good example, someone who was hurt and then really kind of revamped his career. Um, so for someone like me, can you kind of explain how you are able to do that uh, in the easiest way possible for someone who perhaps might not be big on like the Stat most cast. knowledgeable on stats or just pitching in general? <laughs> Hey, it's fine. And and we all have varying levels of understanding of the analytical side of the game, right? Right. I, I, I was lucky because, I say lucky, when my career ended was right when all this information started coming in. So I had just enough time as a player to start, okay, what are these numbers telling me? How can I use them to get better? Then I knew I was done. Now I'm like, okay, I really think this is where the game's going. I just surrounded myself with really smart people that just told me I asked a lot of questions to. And, and honestly, like I keep using those guys. We, we have, I mean, no matter how good you think you are at understanding the analytics and all the numbers and stuff, there's always going to be somebody that's, that's smarter and knows more. So I definitely utilize those guys all the time. But when, when analytics first started really coming into the game, it was so much about the analytics and the coaching and how different they are. In reality, they're very similar. And, and, the, and the coaches that have been around and seen things a long time, the analytics just justify those things. Mm-hmm. Or, or they challenge you and be like, you know what, this is what you thought was happening for a long time. Here's what the numbers tell us. What can we do to, to be able to bridge that gap? And I think my, my favorite part about what I get to do is, is take all the information um, the analytical side of thing, the things you see with your eyes, the eye tests, the, the things you feel from the player, but also all the information on the player, who he is, his background, what makes him tick, um, what is his motivation, like all the psychological things that you know go into the game, all of that stuff matters. 
the psychological side, the background side is just as valuable as the analytical side. If, if I know right away, if I, it, let's just say, for example, I get a, a ping from our R&D department saying this, this pitcher, um, his release height's dropping, looks like his, his stride's getting a little bit longer. Maybe he's getting a little weak on his backside and trunks, trunks just not, something's off mechanically. So I'm getting these pings, I'm getting these things even before I see them at times. Or I'm seeing like something looks off. I need to find it. Boom, we're getting analytical reports on, on what that might be. Come to find out he hadn't been sleeping for three days because his newborn baby's been up all <laughs> night and he's dealing with stuff at home. Might not be the best time to present him with some mechanical changes. You know, so like all these things that go into it is I think the magic behind like what we get to do. So so the, I guess my best way of like answering your question, it was kind of like a long-winded, long-winded <laughs> way of, of, of talking through that. But there's there's always something out there that's going to help you push you in, in in the direction to make a decision. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing something in your eyes, nine times out of ten, there's going to be analytical data to back it. If there's analytical data that's pinging something that might be off or a change, usually there's something we can find real quick in video and and diving in with the player that can justify it. So it all works together. We try to use all of it. And again, I'm lucky to have a lot of really smart people around me that can kind of help drive some of that. And to all the uh, hardcore Cub fans that are watching this live on YouTube, if you want to ask Tommy a question and have us read it to him, the super chat would be the best way to go about trying to do that during the show. Uh, Tommy, Cody is he likes to say he's not the Delmetrics guy. His last name's Delmendo. We have a wide range of Cub fandom in our team, right? And so we have one man that we call the pitch doctor, Brendan, and he is the exact opposite of Cody. He is <laughs> analytics to the point where I don't even know what he's talking about most of the time. Yeah. So basically. I want to. He yeah. wanted this one question asked you, and I hopefully you know what he's talking about because we don't. He says. <laughs> Machine learning algorithms such as Max Bay's Stuff Plus and Cameron Grove's Pitch Grader seemingly capture the most important features of StatCast data. Can any more value be extracted from this type of tracking data? Do you see a trend towards different data types? That is from Brendan in California. We call him the Pitch Doctor. Do you know what he's talking about and do you have an answer for that? So... When I just talked about surrounding yourself with people that are way smarter than you, I think this kind of falls into that category. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I think he poses like some some interesting questions. I definitely know what he's talking about. I think from a, from a Cubs perspective, right? We what we have internally, mm -hmm. proprietary type information, our our background, what we've built with Ivy, and how we use that information is very different than I think what's just available to the public eye. And, and it should be, right? We're the Chicago Cubs. We have very smart people working behind the scenes to create these really cool models and, and algorithms for to help us utilize this data. Every year we're getting new data from different sources. Um, StatCast obviously provided this insane amount of, of body data, where guys are, how they move, how fast they move, data that we didn't have other than what we use uh, with Kinetrax um, internally uh, with the Cubs. So now we have Hawkeye. Hawkeye's taken over all the, the replay system. We're getting pitch data and movement data and stuff from Hawkeye. Some organizations use what these companies provide, uh, a, a, a data download or um, just a, a report of how a guy moves. We've built a lot of that stuff internally to be able to pick and choose the information that we want and how we're going to use it. So I, I think there's always some, there's always going to be ways to find new information, gather new information, find out ways to use it. That's part of our job as an organization and as coaches is like, okay, here's a new variable that we've never even thought about before. What does it tell us? How can we use it? And how can, and how can we, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? How can we use it to, to have a competitive advantage? I think that's that's what we're trying to look at. Um, we have again really intelligent, smart people in, in in house that build models that help us predict um, not only performance on a certain pitch, let's say for example, but if we were to 
come up with a, a plan to change a pitch. Let's say we have a guy who has an 87 mile an hour slider with six inches of horizontal movement. If we want to create, let's say we want to back that off a little bit and get it down to 83, 84, if we gain 10 inches, now 10 to 12 inches of horizontal movement, what is that? What is, what does the predicted model say is going to actually happen? You know, we can have these things run at times before we even start making these initiatives of whether or not we want to make some of these changes. So uh, I, I think there's really interesting ways to utilize information. Um, we as an organization, I think, prioritize how can we how can we stay ahead of the game and bring this stuff in house, learn it, bring real. I mean, we just hired a, a baseball scientist, you know, to help us with a lot of this <laughs> stuff go. as well. So, yeah, it's it's. It's a fun time to be in this part of the game because there's so much information out there and yeah. and everybody has access to it. It's just how you want to utilize it. And there's a, you know, a specific player that we're wondering about, uh, Marcus Stroman, uh, and how the data affected um, you know, how he pitched uh, during the season as far as first half of the season, the disparity between his sinker and his four-seam usage was a lot closer. Um, and then that got a lot wider uh, in the second half of the season. Um, was there something in the data? Obviously, it's his first year in Chicago. Was there something in the data that had you guys or had him, you know, try to throw more four seam fastballs early on the season, and then you changed it, or what kind of was the the reasoning behind the again the the, the similar disparity first half, and then just big disparity in the second half? Yeah, Stroh is a great um, case study. I guess is the best way to, to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. A guy who we signed the day, like the day, like four hours before the deadline last it was, year. It was a buzzer. All I got, like a quick text, like, hey, welcome to the org. Like, let's go, you know, and then I, <laughs> I see in spring training. Um, so it was, it was a lot of stuff crammed into that spring training. Obviously getting Stro comfortable with the organization, um, seeing where he's at physically, getting him ready for the season. And then downloading him, downloading to us, us downloading to him, like all the initiatives, all the things, all the areas we thought that that we could build upon. And one thing that I think he'd heard before um, with the Blue Jays and with the Mets was how unique his four seam could be because mm -hmm. of the low release, the the vertical approach angle. Um, if you just look at it in a vacuum, pitch move why it's not going to impress you. But because of all the attributes he, ha he has, the way he moves, and the way it plays off the sinker, there was we, we all felt, including Stro, that there was going to be room to, to improve and utilize that four seam into the season. I think he also played catch with it a bunch in the offseason, was starting to feel more comfortable. Most sinker ball guys just naturally feel better with those two seams in their, you know, like running along their fingers. Um, we saw it with Darvish when we first got Darvish, he was, there were times where he's like, I don't feel comfortable with the four seam. It feels like I, it just, it feels like an ice cube Two seam in my hand feels great. And there's just a lot of guys that feel that way. So, so a lot of our work is playing catch with the four seam and stuff. And you start to see those quick results, right? You start to see, Ooh, there's that swing and miss. The four seam is going to create maybe some more pop up fly ball swing and miss that obviously a two seam fastball is not going to be able to provide for you. Um, so we worked, we worked on it and we were on the same page, but just got to a point where he was losing feel for his most important pitch, which, which was his sinker. And so we, you, you hit a, a fork in the road, right? Do you keep pounding the pavement and saying like, no, let's stay on it. Um, you know, trusting that we can get back to that sinker, but also utilizing the forcing, or do we say like, no, what, let's reset Let's get you back to what you're really good at doing and have been good at doing for a long time and then piece together all the work that you've put on the four seamer when we need it and that's more of the path that we decided to take and and stro took off you know it's it's a great uh like i said case study of how analytics and information can help you make educated good decisions but you're still dealing with human beings right you're still dealing with the, the feel of the pitcher, what makes him tick, what he feels like are his strengths. And then in the end, we got a, we got a player that knew what he was really good at, stayed with it, but also had practiced the four seam enough to where he, when he needed it in a big moment, he could go to it for that swing and miss. He could go for it to it for the punch out. 
we went to Toronto in that game and he, and he warmed up. We didn't, we, we had a little pregame deal and he's warming up. He's like, I think I'm going to break the four seam route more today. I'm like, great. It's a team we, we wanted the four seam too. We liked it. It's also a team he knows he's guys have seen. So anything that can keep him off balance there. And he had a fantastic game utilizing that four seam a little bit more. So yeah, it was, it was a fun journey um, throughout the year to get him to the point to where he felt, you know, as good as he did at the end of the year. And you mentioned how like made a good point how he kind of took off in the second half. How much of that came from you know obviously just not pounding the four seamer as much in the second half versus all the other things like good health and and just consistency and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think they all go together. I think I, I'm such a big proponent of the mechanical side, the health side, and being able to consistently repeat your delivery. I think I think a lot of pitch pitch shape issues are, are rooted in just mechanical flaws and things that are off things that aren't quite, it's easy to make it. Oh, we need to make this suggestion of like this, your grip's a little bit awful that I always keep going back to the ground. Like how, how are you using the ground? How you're, how you're mechanically, how are you moving? And then let everything go. And, and he was dealing with a little bit of that shoulder stuff that cropped up, you know, in the Baltimore, uh, uh New York trip, um, he was able to get healthy. We, we refocused on the mechanical side of hitting the, the cues and, and the points in his delivery that he felt were going to be the, the best for him. And then the, the pitch stuff just kind of took, took off from there. His, his sinker was, I felt like, just continued to get better, continued to kill spin, continued to, to add you know vertical drop and, and add that sink to that pitch, all while maintaining the four-seam carry the obviously the slider that we know is really good and and continue to hone, hone in the change up so i think it's all encompassing I, I don't think it's one one thing that says like well he stopped throwing his four seam or he became a better pitcher he was also much better positioned physically mechanically as the year went on and and you know just continued to to go out there and compete oh go ahead cody i was just gonna say we, we got a good question in the chat from my good friend mike dubs um and he asks um what do you what do you think of Justin Steele and how the st- the season that he had and you know I don't know how much you're on social media but a lot of people have been comparing him to uh, John Lester based off the the phone conversation or whatever that they had and the fact that he's a lefty and he kind of has that bulldog mentality from the eye the eye test um, how how I guess for, with his question and me together it's more of how were you guys able to help him take that next step because from in 2021, he came out out of the bullpen, was great. And then in the second half of the year, um, you guys gave him some starts and there were some some good ones and some bad ones. So coming into the last season, you didn't really know what you were going to expect from someone like him. And I feel like overall, after June especially, he was, he was great. He was someone that I think fans can look at and be really comfortable in the middle of that rotation next season. So... Yeah, that's a lot that I just said. <laughs> that's yeah. good. I, I, I know what you're trying to get at. That's a great question. I think, number one, I think we, we all think the world of Justin, um, all those things you said, that bulldog mentality, the, the, the fiery competitor, the guy that's out there wanting to compete and is not afraid to come at you with whoever <laughs> steps in the, in the box. Um, yeah. I, I still go back to that Cardinals game with all those good right-handed hitters, and he was just like, here it is. Like, I'm coming at you. I'm going to pound you in with my four-seam cutter, slider off of it. It, remi- it was John Lester, you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago, uh, a young John Lester. So, um, you know, with, with Justin, again, a, a guy that's got really unique pitch characteristics. Um, it, it Pitch characteristics that, you know, organizations are trying to manufacture and teach. He just naturally can do them. Crazy cut to his fastball obviously a really good slider that plays off of that. And, and when you're looking at him from the analytical side, I'm going to put my analytical hat on first, right? So when you look at him, when you have a cut ride fastball, you, you want it to play up in the strike zone. You, it, it's a pitch that is going to generate a lot of weak contact when it's up in the zone the right way, it's going to get a ton of swing and miss. And it's just a pitch that you don't see a whole lot. And when you execute it up there, it's really good. The problem for Justin was when we emphasized, I'm going to come back to, to intention and, and emphasis a lot. When you emphasize up in the zone, when he hit, when he executed him, boom, exactly the results we wanted. But there was a lot more of non-competitive pitches, 
a lot more pitches that weren't that that intention of pitching up in the strike zone for him led to more longer deeper counts um more arm side up misses so we started digging a little bit more into his pitch characteristics and how it moved and when he threw pitches down in the zone he created more cut just naturally not trying to do it on purpose just naturally the way his arm works when he threw pitches up in the zone he created more ride and run so that's where that kind of spectrum of this ride cut fastball um, comes from so you know we're talking with rossi and he's like you know let's get back to the basics of just that like down away to a lefty down and into a right the old john lester approach and like let's see if we can hone on in that area and then let the misses play so so now we're honed in on that one area and we and we justin worked his tail off we threw probably three or four bullpens in a row of just hammering that strike zone that part of the strike zone we called it the john lester approach that was his bread and butter and and the best part about justin was when he nutted, executed those pitches great you know he was able to to have a lot of success when he missed down and in to a righty it was cutting it was a nasty cutter that righties couldn't lay off of when he missed arm side up now all those arm side up pitches were at the top of the strike zone so we were utilizing we talk about utilizing your misses more so than than execution right if we all execute our pitches like any one of us can can pitch can pitch and have <laughs> success with with less than stuff but when you can take the execution plus where your miss is and hone in on an area that really will give you the best chance to be successful and then that gives you the freedom as a pitcher to go out there and be like i don't have to be fine i'm going to throw it to this area if i execute it it's perfect if i pull it it's got cut life it's not going to get peat if i if i pull off a little bit and i and it stays at the top of the zone and has carry then it's a plus plus pitch. So I attribute a lot of Justin's uh, uh, transition as the year went on to one honing in on that area, having a lot of people that have been around a guy like John Lester who have seen that success and the cherry on top, having the man, John Lester, talk to him about his thought process, I think just kind of brought everything full circle, gave Justin a ton of confidence to go out there and compete. And obviously we saw what he was able to accomplish. Speaking of Justin Steele, I think one of the most impressive things this season for me was Steele and Keegan Thompson both implementing new pitches during the season as young guys at the major league level. How difficult is it for a pitcher to implement a new pitch during the middle of the season? And the second follow-up to that would be when they're trying to do it, how do you identify, as a pitching coach, how do you identify which guys can actually handle doing that mid season as opposed to just in the off season? No, it's, that's a great question. That's, that's what we deal with every single year. Um, and it's the decisions we're making all the time as an organization, those decisions are not taken lightly. I, I promise you and making in season adjustments are, are always going to be a challenge, but, I think we've gotten to the point, at least I know I have as a coach, of thinking like, man, this is really hard to do, um, to, to ask a guy to make these changes in season. It's really, I mean, honestly, on the pitching side, it's really not. It, because we're always at the advantage. The hitter has no idea what we've been working on. You break it out into in a game, I, I think that's a, the part of like getting guys to trust that it's at a good, if you're working on the pitch and bullpens, you're working on sides, you're working on catch play. Now you've thrown a bullpen, you've consistently hit the metrics and all the things that we want to accomplish trying to get that pitch ready for the game. I think that's one of the things we do really well as a group is giving them the confidence, like, go use it, go. Here's three hitters in the lineup that it works to, go do it. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it, the, the mantra of like, oh, we don't want to get beat with our worst pitch and, and all these things. That's true. In like the biggest moments of the game, Justin Steele is gonna gonna come right at you with his four seam and slide. But if there's times in the game that we can talk with the catchers, have them on the same page, talk with the pitcher, and 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 see the work that they put in, go out there and have success, it, it, the sky's the limit. And I think we're getting to a point as an organization to know when we can start breaking these things out. We have enough. 
we have enough really smart, bright people in the background that can tell us like, no, the pitch quite isn't there yet, maybe from a data perspective, or it may not be there from a consistency, consistency perspective when we're watching the bullpens. Um, but again, like we're not afraid to break stuff out mid season. I think that's been one of the most fun, fun things uh, over the last few years and trying to determine when guys are ready for that. I, I think it goes back to the, the, the getting to know the player, what makes them tick, um, where are they mentally, where are they physically? Um, there was, I know a, a good story to this is Keaton Thompson when he first came up last year went on a great run like had had I think he didn't give up a run in his first like 14 outings or something like that but he wasn't getting swing and miss like we knew that was in there we knew that was coming but we also weren't going to like hey you're like you're having you're having a lot of success congratulations we want to change you now and like try to re get chasey swing and miss so it's like it's a fine line between okay a guy's ready for it let's break it out versus like, we know we want to do it. Let's let that opportunity present itself. And then once that happens and the player's ready for it, that buy-in's a lot easier, that that transition to like, okay, hey, we're gonna work on it is a lot easier. And then, then you usually have really good success when you're able to accomplish that. Yeah. Um, I wanted we, to ask more of a... We got a super chat. Oh, we better do yeah. a super chat first. Go. We'll, we'll do the you super chat it? first. Uh, Cody, go from, ahead, Reed or Ryan. Yeah. Uh, it's from uh, Nick G. He's asking, is there a use or future use for VR with pitchers, which I have no idea what that means. Virtual, Virtual reality. reality. Even, is, even the old guy yeah. knows that. Oh, okay. yeah, that's based off, that. I guess, uh, Nico mentioning using it uh, for preparing for, you know, taking at bats and stuff. Um, it, on the flip side, is there a use for it for, for pitchers? I never even thought of this. Yeah, I, I think there <laughs> is. It's probably not as much on than on the hitting side, though, because the hitters can actually like, track pitches with it and stuff. One thing we've discussed is kind of interesting is, you know, getting guys to stand in on themselves. Like a lot of guys think they know what their pitch does. And then, and then we were like, yeah, he's, we'll have a pitcher's like, yeah, I'm really getting a lot of sweep on that slider right now. I'm like, honestly, really not. Like pitch data is <laughs> showing that how I test your head is moving. Like you're throwing uh -huh. pitches and your head's all over the place. What you see is not always what you get. So like, if you don't believe us, put put the VR on, go face yourself. And, or on top of that, like having the new, um, the hit track or, or the uh, the pitching machine, like mm -hmm. we can have guys like literally stand in on themselves and track their own pitches to, to see how they move and see the difference of pitches. It That's really the extent of it, I think, on our end. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other part that I, that I love, though, that I think there is room to grow would be in the pitch execution side of it. If you can have a guy put on VR of himself executing pitches from the mound, it's just training that psychological side, training the mental side of executing the pitches, seeing it with your eyes and not having to go through. It's kind of those mental reps that save bullets, you save your arm. I think that's a cool way of being able to, to utilize um, some VR kind of tech in, on the pitching side. We got robot umps coming to AAA this year, yeah. I saw. Like in multiple games a week, how will that impact – you pitchers baseball it i think it's a it's a it's a unique perspective it's a tough question because i don't think we honestly really know the the people that i've been around that have experienced the you know kind of robotic strike zone automatic strike zone have a lot of really good things to say about it the pitching side of the game is always going to be slightly ahead of the hitting side. We're going to find a way to be able to find a hole in it, I, I guess is the best way to describe it. Whether what the minute we realize that the automatic strike zone is giving a high breaking ball, for example, the hitters just automatically give up. Guys are going to start training to throw it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it, it, we're, we're going to find a hole, a discrepancy, a something that may be able to be taken advantage of. And the pitching side is always going to be a tick ahead. And so, you know, I, I think I, I understand where the game is going and why the importance of having consistent balls and strikes um, are. Um, there's such a wide range of, of umpires too. There's some really, really good umpires, some guys that like you want back there because of the feel, 
they understand how the game works, how the pitch movement, how the, the pitches play and how they move. And, and as much as I want that call down away when we set up up and in on a righty and you pull it all the way down away, it's in the strike zone. Is that really a strike? You know, like in, in, yeah. in our minds, like we want to execute pitches. Like we don't necessarily want mistakes getting called strikes. So, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays. I think you would definitely see the pitching side of the game find a way to take advantage of it. Yeah. And in the same sense, um, you know, a rule change has actually come into the major leagues next year is the pitch clock. Uh, we've talked about it as, as soon as the, the announcement was made that it was coming. Um, but one, one of the things is like, how does that affect – you know, the the pitching staff as a whole, obviously a lot of guys that aren't – I mean, not everyone's Wade Miley. Um, right. <laughs> but how does that affect the pitching staff as a whole as far as fatigue? And, and does that make the bullpen even more valuable, especially now that there's, you know, a limit to the amount of arms you can have on the, on the pitching staff? Yeah, I think um, from a fatigue perspective, I, I don't know – I don't know if it's going to change a ton. Like I get, we're, we're going to have to wait until we get more data and information on how trends happen. It's like, let's say at 50 pitches, 75 pitches of, of a game. We have some of that from the minor leagues. We actually ran some exercises. Once we knew that rule was coming out, we had our R and D group start running like, okay, who falls outside of that category that mm -hmm. we currently have? Um, there really weren't a, a ton of guys. There was a lot of guys who were right around that, 15 to 18 second mark so getting guys to go from 18 seconds to 15 seconds it shouldn't be a huge deal there were obviously guys that fell into that 25 30 seconds even at times with runners on on base that we know we're gonna have to to clean up um we also started clocking guys in bullpens like just so we could start calculating the data and be like okay this guy's pretty consistently throwing bullpens at at 15, 16, most guys throw their bullpens at a higher rate than they do their game mm -hmm. reps anyway. So some guys are, are trained to that. So we kind of have a good idea of who the guys are that this um, pitch clock could could really affect. And then it just, it's about training, training it right away, having the pitch clock that first week of spring training out there so guys can, guys can, can hone in on getting the reps at the right time um, I think it'll it'll it definitely will affect five percent of the pitchers, but I think for the most part across the league, guys will be able to make that adjustment fairly easily. Um, first of all, I know we're all sitting here watching the off season from the outside looking in. I'm not going to ask you what you know about free agents and stuff, but I am curious, like how involved you are if you are involved in discussions about. Uh, pitchers that come up like do you give feedback do you give feedback after they have identified somebody how does the offseason work for a pitching coach when it comes to trades offseason free agency all of those things that are happening right now yeah I can I can speak obviously to our organization and, and where things are here I know different organizations obviously do things differently I'm going into my ninth uh, year mm -hmm. in the organization. Um, been very fortunate to, to be able to be um, on, on the front lines, on the coaching staff, on the field, but also be able to be in a lot of the meetings, a lot of the off-season discussions, kind of seeing a lot of different sides of, of the organization and, and what, what goes on you know, throughout the year. We definitely are in communication. Um, there's we, we do a good job of, of really early in the off season process, utilizing every resource we have in an organization be like, to just ask them, like, what do you think we should do? Like, who do you want to go get? Who would you prioritize? And when you ask, when you value the opinions of 60, 70 people and everybody from the, the major league coaching staff to the coordinators, to the R&D department, to the scouting department, what you tend to find is like, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, variance. There's a lot of variables that, that end up showing up, but if ten, if ten, if a name shows up ten times, it's probably one we want to look into. If a name shows up twenty times, it's something we definitely want to look into. Um, so I, organizationally, we do a great job of filling, of asking questions, having questionnaires, having things guys fill out, and then deep diving into the things that we know we want 
that we value as an organization and that we want to prioritize in our free agents. And then once we highlight guys that we want, we really do a great job of, I call it, this is our sales pitch time of the year. Um, we send personal videos, we send, um, you know, we, we do a lot of Zoom calls with players, let them ask questions, um, throw, throw some ideas on, on, on things we'd like to see them do if they were here, let them just talk about their careers and how they value um, where they see themselves. You know, it's, if, if an organization feels like you should do something, but if you feel like you should do something different, it's probably not going to be a very good match. So a lot of what we do is let the player talk um, and, and get a feel for where they are in the career, what they're open to, what they want to do, and then just kind of fill in the gaps there. So it's a, it's a fun time of the year because we have a lot of discussions about a wide range of stuff from free agent guys who want to go after, um, uh, non-roster guys that we feel like are really good depth pieces, um, training drills for the current guys we have, throwing programs, discussion with the training staff on the rehab guy. I mean, it's it's a wide range of things that we're talking about on a given day, so it's definitely a, a fun time of the year. Tommy, my last question, I, you mentioned your ninth season, you've been here for all of David Ross's tenure, you've been here for, I believe, all of Joe Madden's tenure. Um, you've seen this organization, especially the pitching side, um, so, I'm, so I'm sure you've heard the narrative um, from like over the past decade or so, the Cubs can't develop pitching that that is that has changed over the last couple of years obviously um with guys like Justin Steele and Keegan Thompson Brandon Hughes um the, you know guys getting promoted to the major leagues but also moving up through the through the system in the minors um but if you could like point to one specific thing one big change that has allowed that narrative to flip uh what, I mean what would you identify the, the biggest change the biggest difference maker in in the pitching infrastructure this is the easiest question I think you've asked me all day. <laughs> well, I got a, I have an even easier question after that. Okay, great. No. Um, <laughs> cohesiveness in the organization, especially on the pitching side. Um, I, I, again, being able to be part of this organization when this new information technology age just kind of took over, it was very polarizing. There were a lot of people that had very different opinions about how everything worked or how, or how things should work and how the vision of the organization should go. When, when Brez, when Breslow came in and took over this role of like, okay, my sole focus is going to be to, to do whatever I can to improve the pitching side of this organization. You had, you had a clear leader in the clubhouse, I, I would say in that area. Now you start piecing people in that have very unique, backgrounds, can specialize in things, are passionate about helping players get better, are, are open, number one, to having discussions, getting in a room, talking about things, and, and, and being able to have tough conversations about what we want to value as a group. And then once you do that and you have these conversations, you have open lines of communication, then to the player, it looks like the organization has all their, their T's crossed and their I's dotted. They, they, if they're presenting something to me, it's been vetted by five or six people. It's been pumped through the R and D group. It's been pumped through the front office. It's talked about and discussed with the coaches. So everybody is on the same page. Once it hits the player, now it's just go time, go execute what we want to do. And I think Breslow coming in, adding some really bright people into the organization up and down from coaches to coordinators, to obviously the major league staff that we feel like we have and have everybody being on the same page it just makes everything easy. So I, I 100% attribute the the goals and, and the accomplishments that have happened throughout the organization on the pitching side to that cohesiveness and communication up and down the organization. Right. That's awesome. To hear. All right, Cody, hit it. I know what, let's, let's finish big. Cause I know Cody's this is, been, this is this the has best been question. brewing this All question. Right. <laughs> so like, I'm not, like I said, I'm not the ana like an analytics guy, but I'm a big vibes guy, Tommy. Like, and I love going to Wrigley Field on Friday at 120s. And, you know, multiple times I realized this year, and maybe I just didn't pay too much attention in previous seasons, but this year specifically, I went to Wrigley so many times and I saw the entire coaching staff and even guys in the bullpen rocking the same pair of Jordans like every day. And I, the big question for me is, how did that start? And two, how many pairs do you have? Because I've seen you rocking the ones, but I, I don't know if you have any other ones as well. 
Yeah, that's that's a great question and, and an important, <laughs> very important question. Very yes, important. yeah. Cody's yeah. addicted and, to Jordans. <laughs> and the vibes, the vibes are big. I I rock my uh, it's a vibe shirt all the time. Yeah, he uh, does around Wrigley. I love I love that. Um, so yeah, we we gave we gave Rossi a little bit of of crap his his first year because he's a first year manager. You know, you come in. We're like, okay, you know, are we going to have a shoe deal with somebody? Are we going to have an apparel, a coaching staff apparel deal, whatever? And he's like, there's too much other things on his plate to worry about getting shoes for the coaches. And so we had some. And and I, I would have to give the credit to the original, like, Jordans. And the shoe game was Will Venable, um, really, when he was coaching, you know, the bases um, when he was with Joe, started rocking some ones and started kind of up in the shoe game a little bit. Okay. Then when we brought over Craig Driver and Chris Young from in Philly, they had some good shoe game because Kapler, I know, always had to have some good shoe game. So you start seeing these guys, I'm like, man, those are those are pretty nice, you know. And then and then next thing you know, it's just like, all right, everybody, this we we found this this pair was on sale, so everybody goes and gets them. And then we're all rocking them. And then like, ooh, now I need roadies because I got to have some roadies that look better than in the whites. So then you get your red and blue pair. You get your the ones with some gray. And then you're like, ooh, now we got the Wrigleyville Fridays. So now you got to have something with some navy <laughs> and maybe a little bit of the, and, you know, the North Carolina blue. Yes. And next thing you know, you've got five, six, seven pairs of Jordans <laughs> that you're rocking. Um, I, I've got uh, about five or six pairs that I have on on good on good rotation, um, but that it pales in comparison to I think some of the guys. Napoli and, and um, Willie Harris had to buy a shoe rack for the coaches' room just to fit all the pairs because they wear the same every time. Like you know, especially on a run uh, on a run, they're going to rock the same one every time. The pitching staff we've got our own, and so you end up having a pretty cool collection. So. Um, I would say I'm, I'm more middle of the pack in terms of the number, but there's guys that are definitely in the 20s uh, in terms of shoe game. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, yeah. Napoli, if you think he's got a lot of Jordans, Cody, we're thinking about getting him a storage unit. <laughs> That's how many he's got. He loves his Jordans. This was, a first of all, so much fun, yeah. and Tommy, we really, really appreciate you taking time in your off season to talk Cubs baseball and pitching with us. Um, we hope you'll be willing to do it again sometime. But we appreciate this for sure. <laughs> you have to come in, uh, come in studio next time, Tommy. Yeah, well, if, when you're in Chicago. Yeah, if you're ever yeah I'd love, love to. Obviously, appreciate uh, everything you guys do. You know, I think up and down the, the Cubs organization, we, we know the fans and, and the people that work behind the scenes, the, the blogs, the YouTube channels. I mean, all this stuff. I mean, we, we appreciate it as an organization and support and, you know, looking forward to some really good years ahead. Thanks Definitely. again. Absolutely. Have a great Thanks, off Tommy. season, and hopefully we'll see you at uh, Cubs convention coming up. Sounds great, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Right. Thanks, Tommy. Cubs pitching coach Tommy Hanavy. That was, that was a lot, of fun. Was a lot um, of fun. The ending was my favorite part. I, I mean, well, of course, was wondering. it was, Cody. I, <laughs> I, could, I looked over at Cody, and I saw three or four times – he was kind of like itching in his seat. He's, <laughs> He's like, like right? I got to ask the Jordan question. I got to ask the Jordan question. So we saved it uh, oh, for last. Awesome. Uh, the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program is committed to helping families and businesses in the communities we serve manage energy usage and lower energy bills now and into the future. ComEd offers a wide array of incentives on lighting and other efficiency upgrades to commercial, industrial, and public sector customers of all sizes across our territory. Customers can inquire about how to upgrade outdated lighting to energy and money-saving efficient LED lights, <coughs> Cubs, Wrigley Field, Learn more about network lighting to operate your lights through your mobile device and track your facility's energy usage and more. Incentives have recently increased for indoor, outdoor lighting, network lighting controls, and making these projects even more cost-effective than before. Visit comed.com slash poweringbiz right now to start saving money and energy. And to start a project, contact them at 1-855-433-2700. For more information, email businessee at comed.com or publicsectoree at comed.com. And when you have those lights, you're going to need your shady rays. Definitely, definitely. Absolutely. You don't want to be blinded by those those LED lights. You want that's right. I don't want to look in them, but if you are going to, you might want to have your shady rays on. 
<laughs> Shady Rays never understood why sunglasses were so expensive, so they set out to change it. You don't have to break the bank for quality sunglasses this fall because our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. Shady Rays are premium polarized shades featuring world-class optical clarity, substantial durability, and styles catered to everyone in every lifestyle. And the best part about Shady Rays, they have the most insane protection program in all of eyewear, lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your shades on day one, they told us they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. You drop them in the lake, you drop them off a cliff, you leave them on the roof of your car like Luke's phone, uh, and, and they fall off Miracle. this time. Anything that happens to them, they'll replace them. Even with that strong of a protection program, they still manage to make quality that I can tell you holding in my hand seems just as good as any expensive pair that I have ever worn. Shady Rays customers seem to agree with over 200,000 five-star reviews. Shady Rays also provides 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order placed and have donated over 20 million meals to date. They stand behind their product and told our team that if anyone has a problem, they throw profit out the window and do what it takes to get it right. There's free returns and exchanges. You either love the shades or Shady Rays will pay you to ship them back. That's it. And exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is running their deepest deal of the season. Use code CHGO for 50% off two or more pairs at ShadyRays.com. That's buy one, get one free. You get two pairs for as low as $54. Redeem only at ShadyRays.com. Remember, code is CHGO. Go to ShadyRays.com where you can find all their newest and best shades. Well, we have lots we could cover here in the last, like, 20 minutes of the podcast. Michael Collada says, now back to business. Why isn't Rick at sign a shortstop yet? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was Death coming taxes before the end Michael of the day. Collada. Um, <laughs> first of all, the kind of the biggest news leading up to the podcast of the day was the Blue Jays trading Teoscar yep. Hernandez to Seattle, and now, reportedly, the Blue Jays are interested in Brandon Nimmo as a free agent. And both of those names are guys where you could say, well, they'd look pretty good in the Cubs outfield as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but it, not surprised that they're into Nimmo, considering yeah. they were interested in Ian Happ at the deadline. Yeah. So. Well, he'd yeah, be yeah. a great leadoff guy, first of yeah. all, right? You could put him at the top of your order and be happy about it. I I still think that if the Cubs are going to push their first domino of the off season, that Michael is right in saying I would rather see it be the shortstop position than the outfield position. That said. Don't get left behind. If if one of those guys is your target, yeah. See him starting to go off the board. That's when yeah. I get a little, a little scratchy. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've seen some moves already this week, so it's not like it's not like previous yeah. seasons where it's taken till January for guys to start falling off the board. And Rizzo um, signed yesterday. You know, Rizzo signed here. yesterday. Yeah, like Cody um, cried. Yeah, all that. Like uh, Tyler Anderson uh, signed with the Angels yesterday as well. Yeah. So. A few big names. We keep saying, like, yeah, we're probably going to do an emergency podcast this week. Well, I'm getting itchy like Luke. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an impatient person. It's an emergency for a reason, though. You never, you never yeah. really know. Yeah, you never, never. know what's going to happen. So, yeah. But, yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully we see the Cubs do something. Um, also, hearing that they're interested in Christian Vasquez and Omar Navias, which is interesting. I know a lot of people probably aren't too excited about that. I mean, who our catcher was, who, who the catcher <laughs> yeah has, which I, I don't know if we talked about that on the show. I think that might have also happened officially after we had gotten off. Yeah, I think uh, so. That mm-hmm. Wilson had uh, rejected the qualifying offer. I wrote about Which's it no a little surprise. bit. Wrote about it uh, article allchgo dot com uh, this morning. Um, yeah, not a surprise. Um, it also just kind of is, is is another signal of like that that relationship. Not not that it's over, but it's just like. He's going to move on. The Cubs are going to move on. And this is just where they break off. Um, but in terms of, like, Omar Narvaez and, and Christian Vasquez, both solid catchers. I don't think the Cubs are going to try to, you know, if they wanted to invest a lot of money in catching, they would have just re-signed Wilson Contreras, um, which they didn't. Uh, I don't, you know, Omar Narvaez, Christian Vasquez aren't going to cost you probably nearly as much as what Wilson would have um, provide. You know, I know Omar, Omar Narvaez uh, has a pretty solid bat. Mm-hmm. And he's he, a left-handed he, bat yeah, too, right? Yeah, he was up yeah. in Milwaukee, yeah. um, and is you know is two a years ago he 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 was really good. Like last year, I think he had some injury issues and just the offense wasn't fully there. But two years ago, he was uh, he was a big bat for Milwaukee. Twenty twenty one, yeah. Um, well, he he's you know. he's he's a good. Well, I mean, I might be biased because he was on my my confidence pool list. I had Omar Narvaez on there, but he's a good catcher. Um, and I think if you paired him with Jan Gomes and obviously third string, uh, catchers is, would be PJ. Um, if he's, you know, uh, assuming he's still around. Sure. Um, that's not, I mean, I think you go into the next season, you're not like 
that's definitely not going to be where you're getting all your production, but you're confident that they can handle the pitching staff, um, provide at least a little bit of offense, and, and you know not let anything taper off defensively. I think that you're you're fine with that. So, I, again, not the not like the sexiest free agent rumor out there for for either of those guys, but I think both of them would fit in well with what the Cubs are trying to do at catcher. Yeah, he was he actually had a two point eight F WAR in twenty twenty one, not twenty twenty. So. Well, I saw, uh, so Michael it was more Ceram- of like a year ago, not yeah. two years yeah. ago. Michael Cerami, who was in here, you know, what was it, a week ago or two weeks ago, was pointing out that he was great offensively, and then the next year it was the defensive numbers that really were better, you mm-hmm. know. And so you do get a, a well-rounded guy, although I think Nick G says, no, no former Brewers, they never work for us. Hey, I'd be okay with Christian Vasquez to, as well, though. I'm trying like, to think. I'm not too upset with I thought you were going to say Yelich for a second. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> he said, Christian, no. I was, what, what? <laughs> No, no. There, there's one guy like that's one that's guy one. that like he has to Ryan stay Braun with would have been another one. that. Yeah, I like have. he has to stay with Milwaukee forever so I can have a reason to even care about that yeah. about that team. There you go. What uh, how did you feel about the Rizzo deal, which officially hit after <laughs> the podcast yesterday? It was funny because we were going yeah. to talk about the Rizzo Astros rumors. We didn't get mm-hmm. to it yesterday. Turns out it was a good thing because two hours after the podcast or less. Yeah, he inks the deal. With the Yankees, um, and I just looked at it, and I was like, well, he turned down five years, $70 million from the Cubs. Mm-hmm. He's reportedly. Now at, reportedly. Now he's at, like, three for 56. He could be four. He made $16 million this year, this past year. So you combine that with, you know, what he's going to make. I think he's going to get real close to that mm-hmm. offer and, and will mm-hmm. probably exceed it unless he has, six million you know, dollar buyout heaven forbid, in an injury that really slows him down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's still not a done deal that he's going to make more money, but it shows that the offer the Cubs made wasn't crazy. No, it wasn't like a huge underpay, and I think it kind of. But it actually, also wasn't super, super generous to no. the guy that had become the face. Of your and franchise. I also think right. it took it to get what he got. Obviously, took him having you know a couple of really good seasons with the Yankees, or well, right season and a half with, with the Yankees, right? Like it. Would he had he struggled this last year? Would he have even you know opted out of the contract? Would he have gotten the, the deal that he got now? Like, yeah, it, it, leave, it leaves me wondering like five for 70, and he, he not he sees what he's kind of getting. Would he have taken five for 80? Would like would 10 million more have been the number that would have been like, yep, that extra 10 million's and gonna and the thing do that it. like people like kind of like leave out is the fact that the Cubs put that offer out there, and then Rizzo was like, I'm done, like, I'm. You know, right. we're not having conversations until the offseason. Then the Cubs trade them, and we all know what happens. But so, and this isn't me defending the organization on it. To me, there's, there's, both, there's, there's reasons for blame on both sides with this because right now, I know Rizzo said nice things about the Cubs when they play the Yankees in season, but, like, I think from every fan's perspective, we all feel like Rizzo just doesn't like the Cubs anymore. <laughs> and, like, there's good reason for that. But also, <laughs> like, I don't – to me – the Cubs gave a fair offer, but also, like you said, Luke, I feel like, you know, a little extra in there just because he was who he is. He was the leader. He was the quote-unquote captain. Like, he was with the organization for 10 years, and he did everything to help that team win the World Series. And he became, like, the literal face of not only the Cubs, but, like, sport, just athletes in Chicago, okay? So, like, I, I, I get, you know, maybe him being feeling disrespected about that. But, like, at the same time, like, the Cubs were in such a situation where you felt like they were going to have to change things completely. Yeah. They were either have to decide if they're going to change things completely or mm-hmm. just spend and, and try to change things that way. Um, it was just a very tough thing. When you look at back at it now, in hindsight, it's kind of like, well, were the Cubs that off? Probably, in dollars-wise, probably not. But I still think that there's – it's, I still think there's, it's just not a good look with the fact of how it was handled and how things went down. Emotions and feelings got in the middle of it and, and right. impacted that. I just think like, there's yeah. certain Without guys. Without any question. There's definitely certain guys that I feel like you have to throw out the data, the analytical thing up behind, behind it on how much you should pay a certain guy. I think there's, there's certain guys that you have to just throw it out and just find a way to get it done. And Perhaps the Cubs did, did their part, and maybe it's on Rizzo with the fact that he just kind of said no and didn't try to renegotiate after that, at least for, based off what we know. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know what? He didn't, but, have, he didn't have to go through a tank, and this way the Cubs now have one of their top prospects, Kevin Alcantara, which they wouldn't have 
if it yeah. weren't for Rizzo. So that this and, is just the way it's played. He did out. take a team friendly deal when he yes. you know, whenever he was Earlier. young and all that. So like yeah, I talked all about I I made a TikTok about it if you yeah, want to go say, follow as me. We, as we've said, now we can, mm-hmm. can finally be put to rest. Yeah, Rizzo is done. We're I'm laying done. him to rest as yeah, a member I am of the done He's talking about club. Anthony Rizzo and contracts. I'm done. Don't ask me about it. If we have we we all meeting up together uh, at Chris the, Bryan, for the Cubs. What about his what about his Jordan year? game? <laughs> no, sorry. Uh <laughs> How about I just like I'm done. I'm how about, done a, how about your DraftKings pick of the week, Cody? Oh, what, baby. What's something that's just got you ready to make a deal? I placed right the bet now? last night. Your play. While we were doing CHGO bets, I took Gonzaga money line against Texas tonight. Some teenagers bouncing basketballs. I'm excited about it. Uh, wow. Gonzaga plus 105 <laughs> against Texas. Gonzaga coming off a one point win against Michigan State. I think they're going to come out and play better against Texas. They were 12 point favorites against Michigan State and only one by one. Of course, they played that game on an aircraft carrier, but whatever. Um, I think tonight they're going to come out and play two full halves against the Texas. Texas is pretty good. I think they're ranked number 11, Gonzaga number two. Um, I think that Gonzaga is going to give you a full, a full game this time. Um, and again, it's, it's like a one or two point spread. I'm going to mm-hmm. take the money line. Uh, plus 105, you get a little plus money action against uh, the Longhorns. Sorry, Joey. <laughs> Sorry, Joey. <laughs> um, I see uh, Mike Dubbs saying Correa to the Cubs is at plus 220. Ooh, it's come down. It was at plus 280 last right night. Right now on DraftKings. Uh, by the way, Game Time is the hottest new ticketing site that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows. If you've ever dreamed of sitting in a seat you never thought you could, 50-yard line, court side, behind home plate. It's possible with the Game Time app. The biggest last-minute price drops can be found on seats you thought you could never buy. You won't find a better deal this season on Bears tickets or Bulls tickets or Blackhawks. Created by the fans, for the fans, guaranteeing the lowest price. If you love CHGO, you're going to love Game Time. The best way to support us is by buying your tickets through the link in the description, just like Cody did when he bought Illinois versus Northwestern last week. Join over 15 million people who have downloaded the Game Time app and score the <laughs> best seats to all your favorite events. Um, where did I see? Yes, oh, there's well, always a chance, Dubs. Brandon says uh, he's late to the chat, but the Cubs have the best pitching coach in the business. I will say this, and this is not a knock on Larry Rothschild. If if that interview would have been with Larry Rothschild, who I covered a lot with the Cubs, a longtime pitching coach for the Cubs, the stark difference between the next generation coming in to the old Mm -hmm. regime of pitching coach, like it's just a glaring spotlight on how the game is changing, how the personalities are changing. All the data and everything like that. Everything is changing, and the Cubs are now keeping up with the Joneses, as they say, and maybe even pushing the envelope, as he was talking about, virtual reality and this stuff that I never even considered (laughs) would be part of. Right. Major League Baseball, but they've clearly thought of yeah. all of it. He even knew what our Brendan was talking about, which I yeah. thought was complete gibberish, but well, apparently that, that it was not. It was just words was, put in the line. That's yeah, all it was, it was just, to me. It was syllables that I didn't, <laughs> I like, had, I'd never heard put together in my entire life. Uh, before we go, we have time for a, a real quick segment here. I, I saw before we came on a Jim Bowden prediction that Jacob deGrom would get two years, $90 million from the Braves and upset Mets fans. It was oh, just wow. one of those internet things. Like, you know, he's throwing out predictions of what happened. Yeah. The Mets will be stunned. The Braves will give him two for 90. I'm not saying that that's not going to happen. It's just crazy that that would be the point that contracts are getting to in Major League Baseball. We mentioned last season, offseason, right during the lockout, yeah. about, hey, guys are going to start taking these Short shorter, deal. big LeBron paydays and, and betting on themselves over and over. And in the long run, instead of the the – security of the eight or nine year deal they're going to be more interested in taking up pay me now big money this year i might be gone the next year and that would be stunning and by the way um i wouldn't be in on that deal for the cubs next year but if he opted out and went 45 mil after a good season the next year you're not making that deal unless you think you can win the world series that season so that's not for a team pushing to get back in the postseason. That's a team like the Yankees or the Astros or the Braves that think, or Dodgers, that think this is it. These two years, our window is uber open right here. Yeah. I will just say that if DeGrom goes to 
the Braves on a deal like that, I will just be very shocked considering the owner that is on the Mets. Like, I guess he finally had a, a line, if that is, if like that in fact cross. happens. Yeah. yeah, there's a line that he wouldn't Apparently. cross. And which surprised me because we're talking about Jacob DeGrom, a guy who's been with that organization his point. entire career, and two, when healthy, the best pitcher on the planet. Yeah. Like, no, like, there's no, like, argument with that. No, yeah. No. So, unless the guy the was Mets- hitting 100 miles an hour in, like, the eighth inning. So, like, <laughs> yeah. It's, like, it's, like, Unless the no. Mets don't really think they're in that window. Well, they just won 101 games. I mean, I, I believe they do. So that's why, I, yeah. like, if he was offered two for 90, I would see their owner being like, all right, two for 95. Well, who knows? Remember the reason they didn't make a huge trade is because they wanted to keep the window open for, like, yes. another three, four years? Like, yeah. who knows? The Mets are going to be very interesting to look at after the offseason because it doesn't look like Nimmo is going to be coming back there. It doesn't, like, it feel like Nimmo is going to – Take a take a deal with another team, you know. Yeah. Also saw that John Morosi pointed out that he believed the Cubs were in on uh, who's the Dodgers pitcher that just left for the Angels, Tyler, Tyler Anderson. Anderson. That yeah. the Cubs were in on that. Oh, okay. Really? Which would have been but interesting he chose because the Angels that shows you the level of pitcher that they are thinking well, about. At, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, who are the other guys? You start to think of. I'm maybe surprised he chose the other Angels names. unless he just really likes the West Coast. Well, he also had a qualifying offer too, right? Uh, I I, I want to say he did, so maybe that deterred mm-hmm. the Cubs a little bit from really. But going interesting after that they were. It's not know. like that. It's big, the reportedly like, were kicking the, the tires of on that, that level, though. Like I'm okay that they didn't get a Tyler Anderson. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, again, I the Angels, the Angels let him go, and Dodgers. then the Dodgers picked him up, turned him into something. Now he's now oh, yeah. the Angels are like, okay, <laughs> now we'll pay you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who knows? So yeah, I, I that's interesting, but there's still plenty of other guys out there that I think the Cubs will be in on as far as like a middle of the rotation guy. So I, you know, I know a lot of people think that the Cubs need to get two starting, ro- starting rotation pitchers. Um, and, and, and to an extent, I, I agree whether, you know, in terms of, you know, it's a number one or just two middle rotation guys, like obviously Drew Smiley's in play there. Um, if they're not making, I just think the, they need depth. Yeah. Like, if they're not me, making the yeah. big splash at shortstop, then they better add two starting pitchers. Yeah. yeah. Would be the way I would look at it. Like, well, the, the way I'm thinking is if you're going to add two starting pitchers, I'm leaning more towards they just getting two middle-of-the-rotation type guys more than a number one because obviously – Senga and, and Mike Clevenger? I don't know. Senga and <laughs> Corey Kluber? Yeah, something like that. Because, like, I, again, I think, I think they care more about depth and they, and they believe in some of the young guys that they have coming up. Like – Going in next year, yeah, Hayden Wisniewski, probably bottom of the rotation type guy, maybe starts the year in the bullpen and then maybe gets a chance to start in the middle of the season if there's an injury or something like that. I, that's how I'm starting to feel. With the way that we've heard the rumors and everything, I feel like they're going to go – they're going to get pitcher – like starting rotation depth and then really believe in mm-hmm. some of the young guys that they have to potentially be a number one guy. I, I think there will be – a lot uh, more than obviously more than five on the major league roster who can start a game, but there'll probably be a few sitting in triple A just kind of waiting, yeah. waiting to get called mm-hmm. up real quick for a spot start and, here. And, and, that, and, that's and to me, be. I can be fine with that as long as you do sign some starting rotation depth. That to me, I can live with that if you if you do that and you sign a Correa or a Turner or a Bogarts. I think fans can get over that mm-hmm. because again, we're going to next year and we're. As fans, I think the the level headed expectation is win the wild card or win the division. Like I, I, I or not yeah. win the wild card, but you know, get one of the wild card spots. You know what I mean? Like I think that's level headed expectations for next year, and if and then you build on it from there. So do yeah, I would love for them to spend that kind of money on Jacob Degrom, but also I don't know if Jacob Degrom would even want to come to the Cubs for a year where you're not sure what you're going to get. So. I think that's forty five million for one year seems like a lot of dough for a season that probably he's also older though. He still wants to win a ring. Yeah. Like I think all that stuff kind of factors in. Like I've never really fully believed that the Cubs would be in on him. I've always dreamed of it, (laughs) you know, the last six months, but whatever. I'm I'm just giving you my opinion on what the Cubs should do with pitching in terms of free agents, and I think that depth at the very least is something that will be very important because we saw yeah. it in the first half of this past year like didn't have the depth of starting pitching and that 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 made them look like one of the worst teams in baseball so yeah. they need to sure that up and remember up until his birthday last year he was not an analytics guy even mm-hmm. though he told 
pitching coach Tommy Hadovy that he's still not an analytics yeah. guy. He's, so he's, now he's he's no longer an analyst. The, Cody <laughs> Delmetrix has now removed his own nope. title. He nope. fluctuates. From May 17th to November 16th, 2020. That's when you were an analytics guy. Now, From that, like, they should make a, a graphic. We should put it on the internet. <laughs> like a tombstone, the date of your <laughs> analytics era. <laughs> you hear uh, that, Joey? Thank you. <laughs> we'll be back again at uh, 120 on Thursday. Hope you'll join us then. We want to thank our guest specifically, Tommy Hotteby, because pitching coach, which is a lot, uh, he was great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we want to awesome. thank everybody in the awesome. chat that chimed in, the super chat with a question, mm-hmm. uh, everybody that watched live on YouTube and everybody that's downloading the podcast later, make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, all those different things that give us feedback on mm-hmm. what you think of the podcast. Um, and we will see you tomorrow at one twenty. Thanks for checking out the CHGO Cubs podcast presented by DraftKings, America's top rated sports book. Use the promo code CHGO. When you sign up and we will see you tomorrow until then fly the W.